Welcome to this lecture on usable security. I'm Dr. Corey Fecklaris at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. This lecture is one of the principal uh, lectures in our course on usable security and privacy. We have four course objectives. First, to identify end user perceptions and common mental models of digital security and privacy. Second, that you describe the impact of human behavior on security and privacy. Third, that you can analyze usability problems and their impacts in a variety of current security and privacy mechanisms. And fourth, to identify design improvements for security and privacy interfaces. What I have to talk about today cuts across all four of these objectives. And you might wanna to return to this material, for instance, in later weeks, as we delve into these objectives in more depth. Usable security and privacy is at the intersection of human computer interaction and security and privacy. So we combine methods from, and objectives from both areas so that usable security and privacy is the application of HCI principles and methods to the design of secure and private systems. Now, an important concept here, which you may have heard before, is Norman's gulfs of evaluation and execution. So he describes this as a mismatch between our internal goals on the one side and on the other side, the expectations and the availability of information specifying the state of the world or an artifact and how we may change it. And so if you think of the world say as being a technology that we're interacting with, we usually do have some sort of goal in mind, but it's usually not security and privacy. Uh, we might though have to do something such as enter a password or navigate a software update in order to accomplish our primary goals. And we find these gulfs of evaluation and execution all the time. On the one side of this diagram, uh, for instance, we might be asking questions such as, how do I work this? What can I do? And on the other side, you see these questions, what happened? Is this what I wanted? Now to narrow these gulfs, it is important, I think, to use a human-centered design process. This is gonna help us empathize with people in context and define their needs and their preferences. And then we can brainstorm some ideas that we think are actually gonna work for them, prototype and then evaluate those designs. Now we can combine usability with what I've always been taught to be the CIA model of security for a more secure system. And you see in the diagram, CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are three important qualities for any secure system. And also notice that availability has pretty much equal weight with confidentiality and integrity. That means we really want to have a premium on making sure the system is effective, but also efficient and satisfying for people. Because of course, we're not building systems just to build them. They're meant to be used. And also with security, I'd say nowadays, um, many people talk about it more as a process, or they talk about it in a certain use context, such as say, systems for work groups, or maybe systems for publics. Maybe we think about, especially nowadays, critical public infrastructure versus more consumer-oriented systems. And in these cases, it's not a binary state that something is security, secure or not secure. We have many layers of protections, hopefully, and sometimes those layers are very porous, such as the Swiss cheese model, or maybe they're quite solid, and it's very unlikely that people will get all the way through all the layers. And also, I'd say our technical cybersecurity is very, very good. And as a consequence, usually when we do have some sort of security incident, we do find there's some sort of people factor in, instead. In fact, people have been implicated in between 82% and 99% security incidents when you look at a variety of recent blogs, such as from Verizon and Proofpoint. Another important concept that we talk about a lot is you are not the user. And so that's for experts to keep in mind that, you know, we're probably not the person who's going to be using the system. We want to think about what the non-experts thinking about. In this important study from 2015, uh, authors at Google asked, what are the top three things you do to stay safe online? Interestingly, experts would say updating systems was actually the most important thing. 
because it helps us keep one step ahead of attackers as we start rolling out different protections. And also, of course, to use two-factor authentication. But non-experts actually said using antivirus was the most important thing, maybe because they'd seen a lot of commercials for antivirus, or because, of course, PCs tend to be vulnerable. And at that point in time, at least, they were still the most popular computer in the world. They also said to change your password a lot. Now, um, what we found in security research, in fact, is that that's actually not a good thing to require of people. When we require people to change their password a lot, they tend to make it very easy and easy, of course, to guess or to brute force. What we want instead is that they create strong passwords where they're using eight or 10 characters or more, and they're mixing up the types of characters. So it becomes much more difficult to use a computer program to guess what it's going to be. And also, of course, we don't want them to use things that are easily guessed just knowing things about the person, such as their birth date or the name of their, their firstborn child. A 2019 replication study actually found some behavior shifts. Um, interestingly, now experts, and I agree with them here, say we should all be using password managers. And that actually enables us to create very strong passwords, the kinds of passwords we could never remember because we're gonna store them in that manager. And it's nice to see that the public now also, um, of course, they're still recommending antivirus, but also shows now they, they agree, yes, let's use some strong passwords. And also they talked about don't share private information. That's actually very important advice now, especially if you think about social engineering. Uh, that's where people pick up on that private information to try to convince you to give up your account credentials. Now, we talk a lot too about threat modeling, although sometimes we don't use that actual word. But what, what we do with threat modeling is a type of, I think actually a variant of what we've already talked about with design, which is that we're gonna define threats. Uh, we're gonna uh, diagram out and identify um, a lot of factors for those threats. Then we're gonna identify how are we gonna cope with those threats? How are we gonna mitigate them and then validate that our methods are actually going to work? So we wanna ask a lot of questions such as, what are we trying to protect? That's actually very important to know. How important it is, and that leads to how much are we willing to spend because we actually don't have infinite resources to protect things. And of course, who are you concerned about? So there's lots of different types of threat actors we might consider in a simple system or a work system. I'm thinking maybe about honest but curious people might actually get into trouble but lots of different, there's different motivations for people to blunder around or mess with the system. Um, and especially nowadays, we think about ex-partners, ex-coworkers as potentially um, threat actors if, if they try to do some sabotage, for instance. And insider attack, you know, when we let people in our systems because they do need to be available, that's something we still have to be vigilant. Are they going to turn that access against us? And finally, we wanna think about how are they going to attack us? And of course, it's easy to think of technical ways, but sometimes we do need to be creative about the more human or social ways that they can actually come at us, such as to try to trick our users into giving up their passwords. Now, a threat model uh, was gonna help you determine your approach. If you wanna you want be pessimistic, maybe because you wanna prevent problems from happening, You'll use things like access controls, um, maybe some denialists. Um, you're looking maybe to spend on better programming tools or a better operating system. And for users, you might require them to use strong passwords or 2FA. You might also pay for user training. If you're more optimistic, you think that you can detect and then respond to pro problems after the fact. So now you're spending on intrusion detection systems, usually using some sort of machine learning or AI. Um, and the methods you'll use to cope, say, are to take down malicious posts in a social media site. Um, you might want to call in the authorities, such as you call the FBI if you think you've been hacked. And of course, some proactive things you can do too, notifying your users of logins on new devices that helps alert them, say maybe somebody has stolen their credentials or even stolen their device. So there's a trade-off here. Um, sometimes you want to wall out harms, and sometimes you need an open door policy. Um, you'll, you'll choose that more pessimistic approach um, and prevent as many problems as possible if your needs are high enough, such as if you've got a payroll system where you need to protect that critical data. 
The problem is it can be hard to figure out all the cases beforehand. And unfortunately, the costs are very high to make sure that you get it right. In fact, it might become so high that you decide that actually you don't need that prevention and you wanna go more optimistic. Now, you wanna choose an optimistic approach when access is actually the most important thing, that availability part of the CIA triad, and you trust people. So for instance, in a hospital, everybody needs access to supplies, so they'll make that available and they'll just assume that most people are using them wisely. And also, usually then the cost to fix problems is very cheap. Such as on Wikipedia, it's actually very simple to revert a malicious edit if you're an editor, um, there's a function to do that very quickly. The downside is that many times that leads, these problems can lead to user frustration before you get it fixed. It could even escalate into trauma if we were talking about hate speech or bullying. Um, but on the flip side, the configuration costs for your system are going to be much lower. In general, I recommend a three-prong approach to usable security. This is what my own advisors and mentors have advised me to do. And of course, the first thing we wanna think about is can we remove the human from the loop entirely and make security invisible where possible? A lot of times machine learning or AI is gonna be our friend there. But if we can't do that, we want to offer better user interfaces. So thinking about what technical affordances are possible, what kinds of mappings should we make between what is possible technically and what we should support for individuals or social groups? What are people's mental models, for instance, so we can create better conceptual and physical system models? And there's other tricks of the trade we'll talk about. And finally, of course, sometimes we do wanna train users. We need to make sure they're aware, uh, motivated and have some ability to put our advice into practice. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in class.